that's funny. <laughs> Very funny. All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Friday of the month. I mean, Jeans, it's time for the Doctor is in Q&A with Dr. Ron Weiss. It's also the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. So if you celebrate, Happy New Year to you and your family. Please welcome Dr. Ron Weiss. How are you? Hello. Well, it's a pleasure to be here as always. And uh, I'm doing great. Yeah. Who, who was the comedian that said, at my age, it's a pleasure to be anywhere? <laughs> I don't know. They're, whoever it was, he probably came from the Catskills. The That's Fort so Bell. funny. So tell us about Farm Days, because I was a plantrician. You were hosting Farm Days. And some yes. of the speakers actually left uh, Farm Days to go speak at plantrician. You had Rich Roll there. You had Columbus Batiste. And tell us about the event. Yes. Oh, it was uh, amazing. You know, it, it is not in California. We're the anti-California. We're in New Jersey. So 3,000 miles to the east. You, know, you never know exactly what kind of weather you're going to have. And it, it was raining on and off. But uh, all in all, we, we had a little lightning here and there, but we got lucky and it was, you know, it was great. We could do our activities on the farm. You know, because it's it's we like to hold the destination event. Our event is not in a hotel or in a building or a conference room. It's in nature. So our activities spread across this, you know, this working farm and uh, connects people to lifestyle. So um, and a wonderful thing occurred. Uh, uh, Cory Booker, our senator, showed up. And uh, at, on the central part of the day on Sunday, and we had great sessions with him. That's so, amazing. What, what did everybody talk about? Like, what did Columbus Batiste talk about and Rich Roll talk about? Yeah. So uh, Columbus Batiste uh, talked about health equity. Um, you know, he, uh, for people who are not familiar, he's uh, one of the most wonderful cardiologists in America. Um, He's an interventionalist, interventionalist, which means that um, he's the kind of cardiologist who can put in stents and do procedures to people's arteries when they're clogged up. Uh, and he will if he has to, but it's not what he desires to do. His, his, his desire in life is to prevent that from occurring and to reverse these. So he talked about that. And he talked about how, you know, in, that, um, you know, that we need to make good care accessible to all peoples in all communities. So um, he is together with my dear friend, Scott Stoll, who is the one of the co-founders of Plantrition. Uh, Columbus Batiste uh, is holding an inaugural health equity a summit this coming year and you know where uh, professionals will get together to discuss how we can bring about health to communities that need it the most great how many people were there and who did the food and how was the food so yes uh we had 480 people uh up so this was our second full event last yeah. year was our first we had 280 so it increased by 200 um the food was amazing. Uh, have you ever had Dr. Megan Grega on the show? Yes, she was just, we just had a memorial for Dr. Hans Deal. She was on, she's also been on herself, but her daughter did it, right? Yes. So the Kellen Foundation, which is her family's uh, uh, foundation, uh, uh, the kitchen of the Kellen Foundation is run by Amanda, her daughter, who's a CIA trained chef. And it was amazing. Uh, we had, they brought in their mobile trucks. Uh, and they provided everyone with uh, breakfast and lunch, whole food, plant-based. And then they made a special VIP uh, dinner on Saturday night where all the speakers came and it was a $500 per plate dinner. Uh, but you could get to hobnob with Rich Roll and, and uh, Peter Singer and Columbus Batiste and the Shirzais and Bob Quinn. And it was beautiful. And we gave a little concert uh, I did with my son, Yasha, who's a beautiful violinist. Uh, we had a band playing during the day, uh, our house farm band. It was wonderful. 
Wow. I am a man of so many talents. Where did the people stay? Uh, so they stay in the area. Um, you know, we have, um, ooh, because New Jersey is so densely packed. Uh, there are a lot of little towns and, you know, most of these towns have, uh, you know, little hotels or motels in them. Um, so I, I would say there are thousands of hotel rooms or motel rooms within, you know, a 20 or 30 minute drive of the farm. Wow. So people will need a car then probably to get to your event once. Uh, yes, they do need a car. Okay. So are you going to have it a different time other than Plantrician Week next year? Well, um, huh. it's not that we intended to have Plantrician. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that we're a working farm. And so our, our biggest director, as far as the calendar, is our season, right? Because we're working and growing. Um, we're in the floor of a valley, um, the best time for us is early September because that's when we have the, the it's the peak of our harvest produce. We have the summer stuff as well as the fall stuff. It's an intersecting time when we have a lot of stuff. So the the uh, also contributing difficulty is that the Jewish high holidays are generally during this period of time. Uh, then you have Labor Day, right, which is the first weekend of September. So the best time really for us is the very beginning of September. It's okay. also very hot here in August. So uh, we probably would tend to make it in the beginning of September. If worse comes to worse, perhaps at the end of August. But I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I think as far as usually people are getting ready to go back to school, they're on their last vacation, and I'm not sure it would be best for people at the end of August. Wow. Well, it, it just, it's just, I hate for people to have to choose between two incredible events. I know. You know? I know. All right. Well, it sounds wonderful. Did you, so you video. You know, the difference between, I think, our event and Plantrition is ours is for, the Plantrition event is generally for, health professionals. Uh, and our event is for the public. Um, we do end up, you know, end up with some of the same speakers, you know, the, the doctor kind of speakers, uh, or the leaders in the plant-based world. Uh, however, I think maybe what we can do is maybe we can uh, maybe better coordinate with Scott Stoll if it has to be at the same time. So we don't run into, you know, difficulties but yeah. absolutely well it sounds wonderful and we have lots of questions for you you're, you're not, I don't think you'll ever be able to get to all of them today but we'll start with the first one from Luann I'm 66 years old whole food plant-based almost two years and have a diagnosis of venous insufficiency in my legs I'm not currently having symptoms significant symptoms some occasional discomfort in ankles but the veins in my legs are unsightly my doctor suggested an ablation to help with circulation what are your thoughts on this Hmm. Well, um, yeah, so so I can explain to the audience, venous insufficiency is a condition where the veins in the lower legs are not functioning that well. The veins in the, in the, in the lower extremities have a very difficult job because uh, unlike the arteries that are under pressure and have blood pumping through them from the action of the heart going downwards, right? Aided by gravity. Once the, once all that blood from the arteries gets down to the bottom of your body at the feet, it's your veins job against gravity okay, without the benefit of a heart pumping to get that blood back upstairs to the heart. And that has always seemed like an impossible job to me, to tell you the truth. Like, how, how can you get blood to flow up? Look, I'm almost six feet tall. In my case, you'd have to get it to go like four and a half feet by itself uh, against gravity. Well, it is a difficult situation. Um, uh, what, how, what do we have to help us out? Well, we have one-way valves, which are 
which are placed periodically in our main veins. And that prevents, once the blood kind of does get up a certain level, it prevents it from flowing back down again because the valves will shut to prevent backflow. What other kinds of uh, methods do we have to help the blood flow upwards? Uh, we have muscles that surround the veins. And so if you use your muscles and you develop them and you're running and doing exercises, the extrinsic muscle contraction can help of indirectly kind of press against the veins and get blood to flow. Um, um, what other kinds of things could help us? Well, potentially not being overweight, because if you have a lot of weight, body weight pressing down from above, that uh, gives a force down upon the blood vessels to prevent blood from climbing upwards. Um, so that's basically what we have going for us. Um, um, there, uh, and when those systems are not working well, when you become overweight, um, maybe when you're more sedentary, or if you have problems in your veins, uh, let's say you've had a blood clot or the veins are not working well, or even heredity, uh, it's believed that heredity may play a role in, in vein problems like varicose veins, that the veins can not do their job and then blood starts to collect in your feet and your ankles and your lower legs. And that's basically what's known as venous insufficiency. So um, personally, what I tell my patients, and by the way, uh, what, what does venous insufficiency look like? Well, it can look like anything from huge snaky appearing varicose veins, uh, which can be, you know, not attractive, um, to um, veins that are perhaps not that bad, or even if they are, but smaller veins, which are painful and give pain in the lower extremities, to tiny little spider veins, to tiny little like dark pigmentations um, on your lower extremities. The, the, the example where it gets really medically serious is where the, the blood stasis or collection gets so severe and it's not drained out that you can begin to get ulcerations or holes or wounds that develop in your skin. And that's that's serious because they can become infected, then you have chronic edema and it can get out of hand. So if this lady doesn't have any of those um, and she doesn't have edema or swelling or pain or uh, open ulcerations, eh, I leave it up to the patients because it's an, more or less an aesthetic thing. And we there are all kinds of procedures you can get, everything from stripping of the veins which is a surgical removal of the large varicose veins to uh, injecting um, things that sclerose, agents that sclerose or scar down the veins to make them go away like hypertonic saline or chemicals. Uh, I've seen people have laser treatments. There are all kinds of things. Personally, it's up to her. If, if she, if she doesn't like the way they look, this lady can try these treatments if she wants. I don't really think they're going to have a medical impact on her either way. Um, what I would advise, of course, is to eat whole plant foods, which is what she's doing, because that only helps vasculature. And of course, if she's overweight, to become an optimal weight and to get a lot of muscular training of the lower extremities by doing consistent high intensity aerobic exercise. Perfect, thanks Dr. Weiss. I love the way you explain things so well. This is from Paul. He says, I've been having episodes of vertigo more often. I lose my balance for a few seconds, a few times a week recently. It began several years ago. There is a family history of acoustic neuroma. Any thoughts on what to do? Thanks. Yes, well, you know, uh, dizziness or vertigo, which means the room is spinning in a circular kind of fashion, can indicate uh, any number one of things. Um, in its most benign state, it would be called 
benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, BPPV. And uh, a lot of us get that at some point in our lives. Uh, and it's when you will have a temporary, all of a sudden vertigo kind of experience where you're very dizzy and you see things spinning. It can be associated with nausea. It can come and go. But generally speaking, you'll have an episode of it. It'll last for a few days or a week or so, and then it kind of trails off. Maybe sometime later in your life, you'll get it. And, and then it'll be gone. It's not a chronic recurring thing all the time. And so that, that kind of vertigo is due to debris, which gets loose and we believe hits the sensors inside your inner ear that control balance. And it's a temporary thing. If it's really severe, the doctor can do what's called an Epley maneuver, which is sort of like twist your head around and position it so the debris gets dislodged. And that's, I've done that before for patients. It's usually highly effective if they're really suffering. So you can have something benign and temporary like that, or you can have something like that's not temporary. Um, anything from Meniere's disease, which is due to a, a problem with the, the actual fluid inside the semicircular canals that can cause chronic dizziness. Uh, other kinds of uh, problems could be an acoustic neuroma or mask like that. So I would definitely advise for this patient to go see an ear, nose and throat doctor because they're the experts at this. And they may want to get um, an MRI or something to determine whether there is something like an acoustic neuron. He should go. Interesting. So yeah. that the ENT, perfect. Thanks. This is from Anonymous. And she says, I'm not going to do keto or carnivore because I'm vegan, but I would like those impressive results. Can you weigh, at, weigh in on what it is about keto and carnivore that is decreasing visceral fat significantly? And then she says, then can you talk about other ways to decrease visceral fat? Because apparently a lot of doctors are uh, pushing the kind of diet because their patients have had success with it. One physician in particular is even tracking MRIs to show the improvement. I don't know when MRIs are, so. Chef AJ, you know, the number one question I, we used to get was, where do you get your protein from? Right. You know what the number one question now is this. It's like, it's about keto and paleo and how they're so effective up front, right? Uh, they're, they're, they, they can be very effective at losing weight, right? Remember Atkins? Mm -hmm. He's dead now. He's dead. He died a sudden death. He collapsed. Which goes to tell you something. Uh, for a multiplicity of reasons, when you eat a carbohydrate poor diet, right? Which is basically primarily consisting of animal proteins and, and their associated saturated fats. Um, um, it, it does upfront from our experience show that you can lose weight. Do you, do you agree with me, Chef AJ? Absolutely. You can. I have seen patients where they can drop their blood sugars. But the problem is, is that um, you may get these short-term gains, but they will not be, they will not be long lasting. And the kinds of foods that are consumed in this process are, are ultimately highly disease causing foods. They are the basis for the development of diabetes. These foods, in other words, animal proteins and saturated fats are the basis for the development of cancer. They are the basis for the development of, of cardiovascular disease and clogging up our arteries because they are the basis of inflammation. They cause inflammation. Where does inflammation come from? Well, 
a major place it comes from is from visceral fat. And um, I, I do not, I suspect highly that it's, it's not the consumption of the animal proteins and their saturated fat that is leading to the diminution of visceral fat in these people. And I'll explain what visceral fat is in a second. It's probably the avoidance of ultra processed foods and crap, right? That's probably what it is. It's what paleo and, and the paleo and keto movements like to call uh, carbs. Because I've noticed when, when people who are eating a diet like this say carbs, they're generally not talking about vegetables, although vegetables are made out of carbohydrates, right? Um, a lot of the time, they may not even mean whole grains or beans. They probably mean grains, but maybe not beans, but those are whole carbohydrates. I think what they mean is like bread and cereal and stuff like that. So in any event, um, just a word about visceral fat for our listeners. What is visceral fat? Visceral fat is what I like to call the mother of all disease. Um, it is an accumulation of a specific kind of fat, which is deep with hidden within the abdominal cavity between the deep or visceral organs in your abdomen, like the pancreas, the liver, the kidneys, the colon. And this stuff is bad stuff. It's, it's probably perhaps the most toxic kind of tissue in your body. And the reason why is it because it, cause, it pours out and elaborates a lot of molecules that cause inflammation in your body. And that inflammation then is the bedrock of chronic disease. So what I'm trying to say is uh, when people come to our practice here, we always, the first thing, first day they come in, we assess their visceral fat and then we monitor it. And what we do here at Ethos Primary Care is we do the opposite of putting, giving people chicken and meat and fish and some, we only give them plants and we see enormous, very quick uh, reduction in visceral fat as per our measurements. So um, I, I believe that the, the, the people or the doctors who are, are having some, some reductions, I'm not saying that they're lying, they, they probably are, but it's probably from what I've noticed in my experience from the reduction of processed foods, like processed crap plant foods. Now, I also noticed that this young lady identified herself as a vegan. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever someone, as a whole food plant-based person, whenever I hear the word vegan, I imagine that it includes oil, right? Olive oil, mm, uh, things like salt, things like processed vegan foods like coconut oil or vegan ice cream or impossible burgers or stuff like that. And I do believe those things do contribute to the development of visceral fat. So I would try a high level of whole food, whole plant foods like in, that are in Chef AJ's cookbooks. And I think that that causes optimal uh, weight loss and optimization of your weight, optimization, optimal loss of visceral fat and the reversal of disease. I can't tell you how many people, I often see people who are on keto and paleo diets having heart attacks, having you know uh, cardiovascular events. I've never seen a person who ate a, a, a high level whole food plant-based diet ever having this. I rest my case. Okay. So while you were talking, I just got a text from Plantrition because I really wanted to get those dates for you so that it would be different. Their okay. conference will be September 20th to 23 at the Anaheim Marriott next year. Oh, excellent. Okay. So I think we can have ours right after Labor Day. September 22nd to 23rd? 20 to 23. It's a four-day conference. Wonderful. Yeah. I think Rosh Hashanah is very late next year, like in October. 
I'll, I'll Google that as well as you answer. Yeah. I, so I think that gives us excellent. Thank you, Scott Stahl. No, perfect. Sure. Okay. Uh, this next question is for anon from Anonymous. My recent blood work flagged my anion gap as low. It was two. Last year, it was a seven. What does this mean? Should I be concerned? My doctor stated that my blood work looked good and never mentioned it to me. I've been whole food, plant-based, no oil for two and a half years. Anion gap. Never heard of some of these things. And ion. And oh, and ion, I, well, and sorry. Ion. It has to do with the electrolytes in your blood, like the chlorine. You'll see when you get a chemistry, uh, it, it, oftentimes it's called a, a, a complete metabolic panel, a CMP or metabolic panel or a simple or basic metabolic panel. And they get, there are some electrolytes or uh, um, molecular measurements like uh, chlorine, uh, CO2, otherwise known as bicarbonate, calcium, you know, uh, potassium. That's in the basic metabolic panel. And, and anions are a charge uh, uh, atoms of these electrolytes. And they, the lab does this calculation. It's of no clinical uh, importance to you. Uh, I often get sometimes a point out of range for this, or sometimes they'll give these ratios like the albumin globulin ratio or the protein, and it'll be a point, it'll have a red star by it because it was a point higher than a point lower than of the reference range that's given by Quest or LabCorp. It's of no clinical significance. I don't pay attention to it. You shouldn't either. Don't worry about it. The important thing that you should pay attention to on these tests, on that chemistry test, is what's your blood sugar? Is your blood sugar, which comes with that metabolic test, is it below 100, better yet below 90, even better yet below 80? And the other thing you should pay attention to is your estimated glomerular filtration rate. It's your, it's your kidneys and their ability how powerful are they in their capacity to clean your blood, dialyze it, and send clean blood back? And that those are the two main things that you should be paying attention to there in that chemistry panel. You want that to be uh, above 90 milliliters per minute optimally. Great. Thank you. While you were talking, I Googled Rosh Hashanah is October 2nd next year. We're clear. Nice. Okay, excellent. Hey. I, um, have you booked your speakers yet? Because have you ever heard of Dr. Dawn Musalem? Uh, no. What is the name? Okay. So, because you said you're more not you're more for lay people than than physicians. But we have we have uh, you know Dr. Esselstyn has come. Doctor, we have all the same speakers, and you know what they they more or less uh, I think they're giving the same kinds of talks. I think maybe just, you're, the you same just don't slides. give. But maybe their language is a little, but they're very high level talks. Like for example, we have, we have um, professors from Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School coming here to listen to this. They're not, you know, the first time being exposed to plant-based whole foods and they're fascinated. Uh, they, they, they can't believe what they're hearing. So it's good for doctors, but it's, it's this special zone where it's good for everyone. It's it's appealing for everyone, both lay and physicians. Nice. Well, what I was saying is she is really, really an inspiring speaker. She is not only a vegan oncologist at the Mayo Clinic, but she's a cancer survivor and a heart transplant survivor and a marathon runner. Wow. And she's just really, really and inspiring. What is her name? Do she's been on my show, Dr. Dawn Musalem, M-U-S-S-A-L-E-M. -S -S -E and she has got quite a story of hope. Wow. Well, thank you for telling me about it. Yeah, I think she'd be it. amazing. Um, so uh, this question actually is from one of your attendees at Farm Days named Colleen, who says it was absolutely fantastic. And she's looking forward to going next year. Her question is, have you ever heard that certain blood types are required to eat meat? <laughs> A tiger's blood type, a tiger. A tiger's blood type, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, or a lion's blood type. Um, so uh, there was, a, I guess this was more popular maybe a decade or two or three ago, 
eating for your blood type, that it was thought that uh, people with certain blood types would fare better with certain kinds of diets. Uh, but that was debunked. Uh, that is not so. Uh, uh, there was a, the National Academy of Medicine of Sweden uh, did a complete analysis of all the research on this and found that it's just, it, it's not valid. So uh, no, um, eating meat is, is in any significant quantities is toxic for human beings uh, and our bodies and is disease promoting. And uh, I personally believe because human beings, it is difficult for her, us to mo moderate that even in small amounts, it's not good. You know, Chef AJ, when I first became plant-based whole foods years ago, it was, uh, it was 15 years after I forced my father to, to be, become plant-based. And I read when it just came out, the China study. And in the back of the China study, uh, Colin Campbell gives a, a kind of a challenge to people, to the readers. He says, for 30 days, just eat plant. And so I took that. But also in the book, he, he says that it is possible for people to eat up to, I believe he said 5% of their calories from non-plants, from animal foods. And when I, I said that, I kept that in the back of my head and I sort of, you know, cause he's a scientist, he's just telling us what he, what, what the data he believes is correct. But the bottom line is over the years, I've learned that moderating at all usually ends up not in a good place for people trying to eat in a healthy way. So I would just eat whole plant foods and nothing else. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Uh, this is from Kathy. I have senile purpura. Is this just a cosmetic problem or is there something that can be done to prevent blotches? Blood work is normal, 63, plant exclusive SOS3. She's on Prolia two times per year, but no other medication. Hmm. Well, uh, purpura means, means, yeah. means yes, bruising. Oh, it's bruising. bruising. Um, it's bruising. So um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, Jeff AJ, maybe in some elderly people, sometimes they just have bruises all over their arms. Yes. The skin becomes very fragile. I think it's probably a matter of loss of elastin in the skin and the skin becomes fragile, and then you hit it, and then sort of it, it, uh, tiny little capillaries break, and then you see the, the blood flooding underneath the skin, which is bruises. Um, other than eating a diet of whole plant foods, um, I don't really have any better suggestion. Um, I guess if uh, most of the bruises that you see that occur like that are from um, incidental, like minor little trauma, like you're hitting your arms or you're doing something or, you know, inadvertently, I guess this young lady could pay more attention. And if she's, if she's realizing she's doing something in particular, some activity with her arms or legs, wherever these bruises are, she could avoid it. Uh, most of the time, you don't see it on the trunk, right? Which means that, huh, because how often do we, does our trunk interact with the environment and hit things? Not really. It's usually, oh, I'm putting my, I'm putting my arms here, I'm sitting down, I'm, I'm bumping my foot. So it usually occurs on the extremities. I guess maybe, I, all I could suggest is maybe see if she's trauma, having, having minor trauma to her extremities and try to avoid it. Other than that, eat whole plant foods, be healthy and happy, it's not a deleterious thing for you to have. Great. Thank you. This is from Sarah. Do you recommend collagen powder for people with osteoporosis? And if not, can you explain why? 
Hmm. So I'm not a big supplement person. Um, and that's because I don't think our bodies in general were designed to be hooked up to things made in factories. It's not the way our body works. And I, uh, my, I try to design my process in alignment with mother nature and her design. And I just don't think in general supplements is part of that, that come from a factory. Um, now, that would be also supposing that everything that you've, uh, the design of your life is optimized, which for many people it's not. So I try to get people to optimize their lifestyle as a lifestyle medicine doctor. That's what I do instead of prescribing pills, powders, supplements, thick cans of stuff to work on living habits to replace that. So what would this have to do with collagen, for example? Well, um, I think that when it comes to lifestyle, making sure you're eating enough of the raw materials your bone needs to build itself. And that would be making sure you have enough protein, calcium, and other minerals to build the bone. And that should come from whole plant foods. Um, I would advise eating at least 60 grams a day of, whole, of protein. And if you do that, that a lot of that's going to come, should come from legumes, whole legumes, as much as possible. And if you do that, you're going to be getting a lot of calcium and other minerals with that. You should eat dark leafy greens like collards and kales. And if you do all, just concentrate on those two things, you'll have so much calcium, you don't, won't know what to do with it. So now you have your calcium and you have your protein um, and eating all the other things like the magnesium, and the zinc that's in uh, lentils and, 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 and other trace minerals, you'll be able to build their bo your bone as long as you also incorporate loading exercises or loading forces on your bone. And uh, that can be done in any number of ways. I think we've talked about that on the program before. Um, and the last step would be um, just making sure your vitamin D is at a reasonable level. Uh, I don't go crazy with the vitamin D, but just making sure that it's not deficient and maybe hanging around 40 uh, just to hedge our bets. And that's it. Uh, I know of no evidence and because we are evidence-based doctors, we guide our patients through evidence. I know of no evidence that shows that eating collagen powder could help osteoporosis. Of course, I don't know everything in the entire world. And if anyone ever has a study they want to submit or a share that is good and, and indicates this, it would be my pleasure to be enlightened. But no, I, I don't prescribe collagen for a patient. And here's the other thing. This is the other thing that spooks me out about supplements, Chef AJ. They're not regulated at all by the FDA or the government. How do you know that it has collagen in it? Where did it come from? Did it come from the remnants of a, a, a slaughtered animals from a CAFO, a concentrated animal feeding operation? Probably, because that's where, you know, collagen is an animal product. I'm guessing it probably does. Do you really want all that contamination, heavy metals, pesticides, all that stuff that comes through animals and into us? Mm, I wouldn't want it. I don't blame you. Okay. Let's see what we got here. For, okay, from Joanne. Could you ask Dr. Weiss about the best foods for ulcerative colitis? A couple of shows ago, um, you told him you had a lot of questions about this and would start off the show on the subject. Well, it's too late to start the show off with it, but he can maybe answer it now, Joanne. Ulcerative colitis. Yes. So hmm. 
So for everyone who is uh, uh, unaware of what ulcerative colitis is, it is what is one of the conditions known as inflammatory bowel disease. And there are two main diagnoses that fall under this category. One is called ulcerative colitis and one is called Crohn's disease. And they're both very, very serious diseases. They're autoimmune diseases. Um, and uh, where the immune, the person's immune system attacks the colon and attempts to destroy it. I mean, if it's severe disease, it can completely destroy the colon and make you very, very sick. If it's mild, you know, people can putter along with it with varying amounts of treatment. But make no mistake, they are, they tend for most people to be some of the most serious uh, of autoimmune diseases. And uh, particularly because one of the long-term effects is to significantly increase a person's risk of getting colon cancer after having these diseases for about 20 years. So we do really want to cut out inflammation of the colon when you have these diseases. And in my book, the hands down best way to do this is by eating a high level diet of whole plant foods. I have noticed in my patients who have ulcerative colitis, who adopt a diet of whole plant foods. Uh, I do not remember anyone not succeeding in completely reversing their condition and putting it into complete remission with follow-up normal colonoscopies and biopsy with no trace of disease as long as they maintain a high level whole food plant-based diet, period. And the same thing for Crohn's disease. It's amazing to me that, you know, we live very close to Mount Sinai, you know, because we're in New Jersey, we're about an hour away from New York City. Chef AJ, in the Mount Sinai GI department, which is like a major hospital in New York, very old hospital, is where Crone, Dr. Crone once was the head of the department. And so that GI department is like a leading department of expertise in the world on these colon, these inflammatory bowel diseases. And yet, if you were to go there, uh, which my patients have, you will never hear a word about using whole plant foods, or at least not up until this time, as any of my patients who've been there, they just usually end up on drugs. And that is shocking to me. It just tells you how appreciative, and it should let our audience know how appreciative we should be for you, Chef AJ, and your efforts because having a program like this really does get the message out to the public that you can take control of your own health, right? And I think there's a rising quotient of knowledge, of medical knowledge within the public so that, you know, we can sort of educate ourselves. Yeah. Oh, here's a fun question from Diana. Can you please ask Dr. Ron Weiss if he knows any solutions to snoring? Yeah, asleep in the other bedroom. But she didn't say if it was her snoring or somebody else's snoring, you know? Yes. Well, I'm assuming it's probably her snoring because okay. probably, I, I'm guessing, but I could be wrong. But how would she, if, if it's your own, how do you know? Uh, well, because usually your partner is disturbed by and has told you. So uh, the first thing about snoring is you want to make sure that it's not associated with sleep apnea, because a, the fact that when a person has significant snoring, it means their upper airway is being obstructed and there's not a clear flow of air. And it, it input and output from, from your respiratory tree. And 
If that happens and becomes severe enough, it can cause something called obstructive sleep apnea, and that can have devastating effects. That's like a very, very harmful to our overall health. Everything from our heart to our lungs to our brain, it can cause dementia over many years. It's very serious. So if somebody has significant snoring and um, I send them for sleep analysis, to tell you the truth, um, I don't, I wouldn't try to, you know, come up with home remedies because uh, I've seen people with, when I send them for sleep studies, where their snoring was not so bad, but they had significant obstruction to airflow and they were depriving their brains of oxygen. Uh, you wanna hear a story about me, Chef AJ? Yeah, I love to. About um, three years ago, um, I went to my friend, the ophthalmologist and uh, uh, Dr. Armand Fasano in West New York, New Jersey, a, a shout out to him, the, the best ophthalmologist I know. And uh, he got this fancy new Nikon camera that takes pictures, these amazing pictures of the retina, but in places we couldn't see before. And he said, hey, let me try this out. And I was the first one he put on the machine. And he took pictures of my retina. And I have no medical issues I know of. And he showed me that there were hemorrhages on the edges of my retina, which is the back part of the eyeball. And you should, that's not normal. He started saying, hey, do you have high blood pressure and diabetes? Because that's usually what causes your retina to bleed. I said, no, I don't have those things. He said, well, something's not right. And I said, hmm. He said, maybe you should go have your sleep evaluated. I said, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with my sleep. And my wife, you know, and kids have told me that I have like a purring kind of mild snoring sometimes. And what I did go for the sleep study and what we realized is when I lie on my back, my tongue falls back into my throat and it obstructs my airway and my pulse ox saturation was going down to 84%. Like we would get worried with COVID. I get worried if the saturation of the oxygen falls down to like 91 or 90%. When doctors are trained, anything below 90 is not basically compatible with life. And for small periods of time, I was going down into the lower 80s. And that means that my brain is being deprived of oxygen and the retina is part of the brain. And so we think that that's why I was developing these hemorrhages in my retina. Isn't that an amazing story? So, yeah. and, and although I wasn't, you know, it, and, and if anyone has ever gotten a sleep study, my AHI or apnea hypopneic index, that's, that's a, an index or scale which tells you how many times per, per hour you stop breathing or have inadequate breathing. Mine was only like 5.1, which is the borderline between normal and very slight sleep apnea. Uh, so there was no treatment that I could have except for lying on my side. So now because of that, I always sleep on my side or I try to, and I never sleep on my back. And that's the treatment. So, uh, and when I do lie on my side, there's no snoring. Well, that's neat. So in any event, um, the other thing, uh, advice I can give this young lady is if you're overweight, lose weight by having a whole food plant-based diet, because uh, people who are overweight have a lot of in, uh, excess tissue, like in the neck, in the, their tongues are larger, their throat has a lot of excess tissue. And by losing weight, that goes away. And then uh, the, most of my patients, their snoring vastly improves, even with 20, 25, 15, 20, 25 pounds of weight loss. That's, you know, it's interesting. My husband's yeah. so thin and he's... 
but he may be his tongue may be falling yeah. back in his airway. So if it does, uh, hmm. He, you know just, he, he does have yeah. sleep apnea. He just got some kind of special dental device that he's starting to yeah. work. Yeah, they, they have retainers. They have something that forces the jaw forward. Uh, these days, you know, we have such all these Fitbits and all these electronic devices. Uh, we are, I am trying to experiment with our patients in trying to have like home pulse oximeter readings, right? The pulse ox readings with, that we you know, became used to during COVID. And there probably is a way to monitor that yourself at home. And they, they seem to be fairly accurate. I would at least do that to make sure you're not desaturating and becoming low in oxygen during the night, because that's the danger that's associated with snoring. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Here's from another attendee of your wonderful farm days. And oops, where did it go? Her name is... Susan, she said, I attended Farm Days this past Saturday, and I want to thank you for a wonderful experience and for all you do. I was wondering, when did you adopt a plant-based lifestyle, and how do you handle family get-togethers with five brothers and sisters with different dietary preferences? I find it difficult to have holiday family gatherings and have them respect my dietary choices without respecting theirs. Yeah. So, yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. Which you know, Chef AJ, that's like one of the top concerns of anyone who's plant-based. Uh, just really quickly, uh, I think we have a couple of minutes left. And I know I have a patient at three o'clock. But to answer your question, um, so uh, I just ate a regular omnivorous diet. I mean, it was a healthy, quote unquote, diet with a lot of plants and vegetables and fruits, but chicken and just omnivorous cheese. It wasn't healthy. <laughs> so um, I did that until my father uh, got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, then I found out about the macrobiotic diet, which is a kind of whole food plant-based diet. Uh, we convinced him to do that in solidarity. I did it with him temporarily. Uh, he had an amazing response to it and it improved his survival by three or four fold. Mm. Uh, but after he passed away, um, I reverted for the next 15 years back to just whatever, you know, eating chicken parmesan until I picked up the China study soon after it came out. When did that come out? About 2008? Oh, I don't remember. Something I, I, like that. It, so long ago that it wasn't on Audible, it was on CDs. Yeah. <laughs> I had to listen well, to and I dad. stood, I sat up. For three nights in a row reading that, I couldn't put it down. And finally, I closed it and I said, I can't do this anymore. I have to only eat plants because it answered many of the questions that I knew I had about my father's condition. Like, why did my father's pancreatic cancer shrink? Why did he get better? And for the first time, it, it, Colin Campbell had ideas in there. And I, I started to grasp onto the fact of why my father got the cancer in the first place. And being in my early 40s um, to mid 40s at the time, I just didn't want to get cancer like my father. And so I decided to only eat plants. So uh, that having been said, it wasn't like someone turned on the light switch. It was in the beginning. It was. I, I took his the 30 day challenge, which I told you about was at the end of his book. And I was only eating plants for 30 days, of course, but then I deteriorated along the way. I was mostly plant-based, but you know, it took a couple of years before I actually stopped eating pastrami annually, before I stopped eating white turkey breast every Thanksgiving, before I stopped eating, wedging in my favorite, which is thin crust Italian New Jersey a la Sopranos pizza, drippy with cheese. It took a number of years uh, because I took that name as whole food plant-based, as meaning, oh, it's plant-based. You know, cognitively and intellectually, I made excuses for myself. I didn't realize, oh, I don't have to, I'm not a vegan. I'm only 
whole food plant based. And so I allowed these things. But when I realized that it was destructive to me and my ability to sustain the good parts of my diet, I, I had to cut them out eventually. And you realize the same thing, right? Chef AJ? Absolutely. Because when the, when things start to leak into your life, these drugs, it's like if I'm an alcoholic or I have an alcohol use disorder and I just have a drink once in a while, or I was a two pack a day smoker, I quit, but I just have a cigarette once in a while. It, it can't work. And because of that, you ultimately have to be very careful when you go out with your friends and with your family. And I acknowledge that it's very difficult. Social situations are really tough. Um, and your family, there's a chance that they will really never understand why you are doing this. They will think you are mishuga mm -hmm. and, and that you're insane and this is extreme. But as you go on your way, uh, someone after a few years will get sick or they won't get sick or they'll want to lose weight. And one of your family members is going to look at you and look how fantastic you look and how you don't get colds anymore and how you made it through the pandemic without dying. And they're going to say, you know what? Hey, my, my blood sugar is kind of high. I, it was never like that before. What is that that you're eating? Can I give me some recipes? And pe some people will start to migrate over to you and you will get people who are joining you, but it's not going to be on in early days. Stay, I think Doug Lyle, right? Has a lot of resources and nice little tips on how to deal and negotiate with yeah, he called it getting, getting along without going along. Is that, can you recommend that, Chef AJ? Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the chapters in The Pleasure Trap, and he has a talk by the same name. Is it on uh, YouTube? I'm pretty sure it is, either on YouTube or on his website, I Steam right. Dynamics. Yeah, and he is one of the funniest plant-based whole foods people I've ever known. Yeah. So listen to going, getting along without going along. Well, why don't you invite him to Farm Boys? I mean, Farm Boys. We would. <laughs> Uh, we would. Boys. There's a whole long list, and you are on that list. Too. Oh my God! I, if Doug goes, I'll go. You know, it's so funny. I used to live next door to a produce store called Farm Boys Farm Days. <laughs> yeah, that's we funny. Will. Well, yeah. Doctor Weiss, I can't. I don't even want to tell you the amount of questions we have left. We might have to have you on next month and pretend that you're not coming, so people will stop because you you probably have at least twenty more questions. But I'm sure we'll get to them eventually. Well, that makes me feel good. Thank yeah, you. they they thank love you, Doctor Weiss. So thank you. Thank you. And Shana Tova to you. And Shana to Tova everybody. to you and, and all of our Jewish friends. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Weiss. Anytime. Take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for Nandita Shah, Dr. Nandita Shah. She's going to be talking about B12 and D and other things. And there's always an Indian recipe, oil-free 